Watch this. Well, thank you for joining us today on the 208 here on your Wednesday afternoon. I'm Joe Paris filling in for Brian Holmes. Well, heading on, uh, going on, I should say, downtown right now in Boise, Tree Fort Music Festival. They just kicked off a few hours ago, and it does come during one of the worst surges of the pandemic that we've seen thus far. Now, organizers at Tree Fort tell us that they've had to shift their plan several times over the last 18 months to make sure they could do the event safely. But the festival director tells me the spirit and energy of Tree Fort, it's still there as they balance those COVID protocols. Hey, one, two. The pandemic delayed edition of Tree Fort Music Festival is finally underway. We checked in over a thousand people yesterday through our, our pre-check and our box office and spirits were really high, everyone wearing masks. It really felt really great. Eric Gilbert is a co-founder of Tree Fort and the festival director. The priority this weekend is to celebrate music in downtown Boise, but keeping everyone healthy and COVID free is certainly a main focus. Yeah, everyone's taking the, the, the protocol seriously thus far, which we're excited for. You know, we're really mass are required, but we're really in the spirit of just really asking our community to um, to comply because we're really it's really important for the music community and our community at large that we show that events like these can move forward if we're willing to adapt to the moment. It is difficult to get everything done correctly, but it seems like you guys have gone the extra mile to make sure you've checked all the boxes. Yeah, we've had a year and a half since COVID started to really think through how this can work and how we can adapt. And obviously now that the vaccines are here, we've learned a lot about what mitigation efforts work best. And, and so we're, we're applying all that knowledge to how we're moving forward. And I really believe that um, events that can and, uh, and are willing to adapt to the moment should move forward because it really sends the right message that the vaccines work, masking works, and all these things can work. Gilbert tells me about 6,000 passes were sold to Tree Fort before sales were cut off last week. Ticket sales were stopped as a part of Tree Fort's commitment to cut down on the amount of people attending the events. We cut ticket sales off, and so we really think um, on purpose, and we kind of that was one of our designs we started last spring, that we were probably going to model a smaller version of the festival. So I think for everyone coming, it's going to be a lot of our core crowd who've been coming for years, and it's going to feel like some of the like early days, and it's going to be like kind of our core fans. It's going to feel smaller, a little bit more space for everyone to move around. Everyone's going to be masked, um, but I think the similar Tree Fort spirit is going to be there, and I'm excited for that. The decision to stop ticket sales does come with the price, but Gilbert says it's important to festival leaders that they do the event responsibly because they do care about what's going on with the Idaho health care system. About 30% of our annual sales happen during the week of the festival, so we cut off that. So we imagine having at least a 30% reduction, not only on our sales, but in our attendance itself. And I think the statement we're trying to put out there is that that's part of how we manage through a pandemic is, is we do need to allow for more social distancing and, um, and more space. Gilbert says despite COVID challenges, the Tree Fort team believes the event will deliver the same great experience as in years past. Tree Fort is a great celebration centered on music, arts and culture. And those are definitely things that the pandemic has heavily impacted. So this year, Tree Fort comes with a special meaning to many. We're doing this to show that, um, you know, that, that music matters. The music community matters. It's really important to the overall well-being of our community. And we can do these things if we do them safely. So please follow what, what we're asking. Remember, you got to come down with proof of vaccination or proof of a negative test within uh, 40, 48 hours. And please wear, wear, wear your mask. And if you do have any questions about the Tree Fort COVID protocols, we have a real quick list for you right now at KTVB.com. So they are rocking in downtown as we speak. They kicked off about 3 o'clock with the first musical act. If you rush down right after this show, you can catch the talented Sophia Valdez. She's performing at 530 on the main stage downtown. And I got to tell you, she is awesome and truly has the voice of an angel. Get down there if you can. But if you are stuck at work or just getting home right now, no worries. The last act to perform on day one. It's actually at one o'clock. Technically tomorrow morning you can catch Mr. Grant Olson 1 a.m. at Neuralux. They have a great palette of sounds and tunes. Um, so great musically, honestly, especially early in the morning. If you do miss Tree Fort this weekend, do not fret. There's going to be another one coming up quickly early 2022. So that's right. Two Tree Fort events within six months. As we heard Eric Gilbert tell us that he's very excited about this weekend, but they also are concentrating on what will be the 10th annual Tree Fort event. Well, turning now to some serious news, the city of Crouch in the Garden Valley community continue to mourn the loss of late fire chief John Duvall. 
John DeVal, who uh, lost his battle to COVID and he was not vaccinated. He was the fire chief at the Garden Valley 1st District for 21 years. It's been one week since his passing and DeVal's friends and loved ones shared memories and messages about the hero he was and the legacy he leaves behind. Here's our Katya Stepovic. In the tight-knit town of Crouch. It really devastated us all. People like Marsha Hefner, owner of the trading posts in town, are feeling the loss of a man that many say held the community together. How do you put in words someone like John? John DeVal was a fighter from the very start. Volunteering as a firefighter in high school, he joined the Garden Valley Fire Protection District in 1995 while working in construction. Then, not long after that, he became the fire chief and an EMT, transforming the department and unknowingly the community too. It is incredible what he has done for that fire station, uh, for this community, and built everything up and he dedicated so much of his time. I mean, I was wondering if he ever slept. DeVal would visit the trading posts often and talk about his kids and grandchildren with Hefner. He, he was just enjoyable to talk with and I'm, I'm going to miss, what, you know, the dedication that he had for us and that he cared a lot for the community. He was always on all the runs and always helping everybody, you know, and um, I just, I was blown away by how he turned everything around. DeVal also had training and certifications in swift water rescue, technical rescue, rope rescue, hazardous materials management, and wildland firefighting, just to name a few. Robert Glankler is the department's interim fire chief while they look for a new replacement. I think when he first came here, it was definitely, you could tell it was a department that needed a lot of uh, upgrading and uh, positive thinking uh, and he's changed a lot of this this fire department because now we have three stations that we keep apparatus at and we have a lot more personnel that are responding to calls. He was a great person honestly probably the most brilliant person I've ever met. Um, he had every question you could possibly answer on top of his head. Um, He's a great leader and uh, we, we miss him a lot. Austin Fields is a firefighter and EMT with the Garden Valley Fire District. He worked with DeVal since 2015. He says DeVal was a fighter from start to finish. I talked to him on the phone and uh, he was in just the ER at that point and I talked to him over the phone and uh, in true fashion he was delegating, delegating tasks and uh, making sure that we were carrying on without him. And that was the last I spoke to him. After a month of fighting, the virus took over. It's somber right now. Uh, people are still kind of reeling from the shock. It was just shock. Um, you know, I've, he's always been just a very strong person. And so, you know, to find out that he wasn't able to put up the fight anymore was, was really hard for all of us. You don't imagine something like a virus taking down a hero, and that's truly what he was. Friends and family say DeVal was more than his title and certifications. He was a family man, a hero who meant a lot to the community, and they to him. Moving forward without him is something that no one wanted to imagine. There's a lot of emotions. Um, you know, every day is different, and it's just moving along, and honoring him as best we can. I just would have told him I loved him and would have thanked him for everything he taught me and what he did for not only the department, but the entire community. A hero lost, but never forgotten. I asked him, I said, John, when do you plan to retire? And he said, in three years, I'm gonna work for three more years and then I'm gonna retire. It was very, very, very hard, yeah. He, he, he's going to be really missed, that's for sure. A memorial took place last week where DeVal's family and fire personnel were all present, and the procession will take place here in town on October 2nd. In Crouch, Katia Stepovic, Idaho's News, Channel 7. Garden Valley Fire tells us that Chief DeVal was not vaccinated, and they're calling his death a line-of-duty injury. They say that he was exposed after he responded to a call to help a patient who was very sick with COVID 
Five days later, Deval came down with symptoms and later died. It's been nearly two weeks since President Biden's sweeping executive order on vaccine mandates for millions of workers. Today, 10 Idaho lawmakers are deciding if they want the state to push back. It's that time. Grab your phone and connect with us. I want to talk to you. Text us questions, comments, whatever you feel about the show. 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name and the hashtag the 208. We'll share as many as we can at the end of the show. Can you speak to if we are, if this is unplowed and unsettled legal ground then around a federal vaccine mandate? I do think it's somewhat unsettled at this point. Unsettled and unplowed, a pretty good way to describe the situation Idaho's leaders find themselves in today as they decide if they should try and take action on President Biden's executive order on vaccine mandates. The Committee on Federalism, which was created just two years ago and meets only on an interim basis, called for a last minute meeting to talk over the executive order, which requires companies with more than 100 employees, federal employees and contractors of the federal government to get vaccinated or be tested for COVID weekly. Now, just last week, Governor Brad Little, along with other state leaders, sent a letter to President Biden threatening legal action should he not rescind his executive order. This afternoon, Idaho Chief Deputy Attorney General Brian Kane explained how and what Idaho could fight. Within this context, right, if the federal government is regulating its federal employees, we're going to have a very hard time being successful in getting into court. When we step down to the federal government regulating contractors with the contracts with its federal employees, and when I read the executive order, it will actually have language within the contracts addressing this, right? So now you've got employers who are consenting to these terms um, within the federal contracts, again, it becomes very difficult for the state to insert itself into that equation. Now, when the federal executive overextends through its rulemaking authority, we then have the ability to challenge that. But if our challenge is unsuccessful, then we run the risk of likely federal preemption, meaning the state can pass what it wants to but at the end of the day, the federal regulation will be considered the law of the land um, and what the state has done in that space will be preempted. As of today, the Biden administration has not enacted the, the rules requiring companies with, again, more than 100 employees to require the vaccine. Now, the committee did take some public testimony today. The majority of people which were for bringing lawmakers back to enact legislation against vaccine mandates. Now that meeting just wrapped up about an hour ago and the committee decided they're going to hold another meeting. They're going to meet again next Tuesday to continue their discussion. So no decision yet on if the committee will recommend calling the legislature back. But if they do, Speaker of the House, Republican Scott Bedke, he would also have to agree to this as well because the House never technically adjourned for the year. Signy die. So it's at Speaker Bedke's discretion at this point. 
As for the Senate, they formally adjourned for the year and it takes two to tango. So if we got to the point where the Senate was needed to be called back to enact legislation, it would honestly put us in a weird legal position. And it's one of those we'll find out what happens if we get to that point. Well, lately on this show, it seems like we've been spending a lot of time fighting misinformation, but it just keeps coming up. We keep getting your texts. We keep fact checking. Today, it's with Idaho's Lieutenant Governor, who is actively campaigning to become Idaho's next governor. Yesterday, Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan sent a campaign email claiming that Boise State is imposing vaccine passports on their fans. She says, quote, in an email, this last weekend, Boise State University opted to impose a vaccine passport mandate on students attending the home football game. They further announced that this mandate would be imposed on all attendees for future games, end quote. Now, the lieutenant governor included a copy of Governor Little's executive order from earlier this year, which says no state entity can require vaccine passports to access state services or facilities. And technically, Boise State is a state entity because it's a public university. McGeehan then linked to a KTVB article about Boise State's new policy, highlighting only a portion of the headline. First, vaccine passports are banned in the state of Idaho, per an executive order issued by Governor Little back in April. It says that, quote, no department, agency, board, commission, or other executive branch entity or official of the state of Idaho shall require as a condition of accessing state services or facilities that an individual produce proof that he or she has received a COVID-19 vaccine. So technically, yes, Boise State is requiring students and possibly all fans for the Boise State Broncos next home game to provide proof of, proof of vaccination to get in. However, that's not the only way to get in. Boise State's also giving fans the option to instead provide proof of a negative COVID test in a place of showing a vaccine card. So whether you're vaccinated or not, you can take the second option and show a COVID test. So there's a choice. It's not one or done, meaning the policy does not violate Governor, Lato Governor Little's executive order. Words matter. And when you send out words in a campaign email, those words matter as well. And you may disagree with what Boise State is doing to protect our community from COVID, but when you say that Boise State University opted to impose a vaccine passport mandate, it's simply not true. By the way, still no update on if that Boise State policy will expand to all fans when Nevada comes to town on October 2nd on the blue. Okie doke, that's enough with the COVID talk for today. So how about this? We are putting music fans to the test. Do they know their tree fort bands? We'll find out. And it's last call. Get your comments and questions into us now. Text me directly, 208-321-5614. Make sure to include your name in the hashtag the 208. We'll share a few of your texts on air coming up at the end.
Well, the stage is set for a great few days of music at the Tree Fort Music Festival in downtown Boise, and there's a good chance you're going to see names in the festival lineup you probably never heard of before. But that's good. It gives you an opportunity to go out and find your new favorite artists. That's something I've done in the past. Just went to a random show, found some brand new music I loved. But we were curious if the people milling around downtown Boise today at about lunchtime, well, we wanted to know if they could identify the acts playing this weekend. So photographer Kevin Esslinger and I set up a little game. We named three bands to people in downtown Boise. We gave them two real tree fort acts and then I made one name up and we wanted to find out if people could identify what's real and what's not real. Let's see how everyone did. So I'll tell you two bands that are playing tree fort and then I'll make one up and you'll see if you can figure it out. You want to do it? All right, come on over. Sugar Candy Mountain. The Saucy Nuggets, Gary V. I want to say the Saucy Nuggets because I like that name a lot. <laughs> I, I second that, yeah. Well, you got it right. There's no Saucy yeah, Nuggets. That's a great band name. I know, that's going to be our band name. <laughs> Bearcat, Orchestra Gold, Clear Sky. Orchestra Gold, Bearcat. It's Clear Sky is the fake name. Oh! I just looked behind you. It's a pretty clear sky today. Oh, that's not bad, yeah. That was good. <laughs> Lake Street Dive, Japanese Breakfast, and bird person. Okay, I have heard of the first one. I think it's the third one's fake. Really? It's, yeah, because it's from a show. Bird person's from Rick and Morty, right? No, I think it's the guy that has the snake hand and then the... I I think it's bird person's, okay. I think bird person's fake. That's true. Yes! <laughs> bird person, That's not a real, that. it is a character from Rick and Morty. That is yes. correct. Nice. Night Jewel, Angel Dust, Walking Backwards. Night Jewel. Is your guess. Is my guess. Incorrect. Oh, They're playing on walking Friday. Backwards. Walking backwards oh, I made up. I knew up. it. I just didn't think I saw a guy it. down there walking backwards. Oh, nice. Sugar Candy Mountain, Japanese Breakfast, Driving West. Uh, the Japanese one. Japanese oh, Breakfast? why didn't you tell me? All right, Rick, here are three names. You'll pick the fake one. Street Fever. Blood Lemon or Dog on a Bench? Street Fever. That's a real band. It is? The fake one was Dog on a Bench. Oh, geez. I saw a Dog on the Bench over there. I gave him the Okay, idea. I don't get a prize. No prize. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for your time. Okay, take care. All right, see you guys. Have a good ride. <laughs> All right, well, you're in luck. Every Tree Fort, I asked Tree Fort co founder and festival director Eric Gilbert for his short list of bands that you need to see during Tree Fort. And these are bands that you likely have not heard of before, but they are all really good. I licked them, I looked them all up. And here's uh, some to keep an eye out for. Don Richard, um, really think New Orleans dance music, really fun. Um, Madhu Mokhtar, they shred awesome guitars and they have really good music. They're from Northern Sahara. Aruj Aftab is a Pakistani singer with an absolutely amazing voice. And fans call her music very powerful and moving. It's an experience that really can only feel in person. And finally, this is one of my favorites, Ila Bamba. If you go see them, get ready to dance because they've got the best energy. It's a great group. Be ready to dance with them. These are just some of the hidden gems at Tree Fort Music Fest.
It's almost 5.30, you know what that means. It's time to take a look at your questions, comments, whatever you send us to the, the text line. Uh, this one says, Joe, you need to wear a flamboyant jacket like Brian. Dean, I gotta tell you, when I got dressed this morning, this was the most flamboyant thing I had. It's my Miami Vice jacket, so, but I am in the market for more. I'll, be, I'll look. Uh, still working at Counting Do 1 million, but wanted to take a break from it to say, love seeing you host the 208. Jamie in Nampa, and Jamie continues to, to count the numbers off there. Jamie, I got to tell you, to count to a million, it's taking a lot longer than Brian and I both thought. And then this person says, thank you to all the healthcare frontline workers and all who work in real and work in related fields, that is. We appreciate all you do. Hashtag the 208. I, we talked about this on the show several times this week, but thank you so much to our frontline healthcare workers. If you can, go out of your way this week to thank a frontline healthcare worker or someone in the healthcare industry. It really does mean so much to them to have our support. All right, we're going to step away for now. Brian should be back very soon. Tune in tomorrow.